Thank you, Professor Mohammed. Thank you for the nice introduction. Dear Chairman, dear colleagues, I want to speak this time about diabetic retinopathy. So, communicable diseases, their eradication, uh, vaccine have always been on the global agenda when it comes on health. Just before the COVID-19 hit the world, 2019 report of the UN Sustainable Development Goals was published in July this year that provides the blueprint for shared prosperity in a sustainable world. The core mention was malaria, tuberculosis, HIV under SDG3, which is about ensuring healthy lives and promoting well-being for all at all ages. Then on January 31st of 22, WHO declared coronavirus as a global emergency and formally declared the coronavirus as global pandemic on March uh, 20, uh, 2020. And then the world came to a kind of standstill for some time. 2022 report clearly mentions that COVID-19 is impeding uh, progress in meeting goal three targets. The report emphasized that the pandemic has severely disrupted the essential health services, triggered an increase in the prevalence of anxiety and depression, lowered global life expectancy, derailed progress towards ending HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria, and halted two decades of work making health coverage universal. They again emphasized the need of an urgent and concerted action to set the world back on a trajectory towards achieving goal three. As to the ophthalmology practices during that time, in May 2013, uh, in May 2003, the World Health Assembly unanimously passed a resolution that urges member states to commit themselves to supporting the global initiative for the elimination of avoidable blindness by setting up a National Vision 2020 plan in partnership with WHO and in collaboration with the NGOs and the private sector. Vision 2020, the right to sight. So no question that the pandemic also threatens the resounding successes of the Vision 2020 program. The impact of COVID-19 need yet to be fully determined but especially in low and middle income countries, eye care services were also disrupted. Even the staff of the eye clinics were redirected to manage the local outbreaks. The services in the eye clinics have slowed down or suspended for some time. Mid-March 2020, the US Center for Disease Control and Prevention and also the American Academy of Ophthalmology recommended that physicians, including the ophthalmologists, limit in-person care to urgent and emergent uh, patients. Actually, this has been the recommendation of health authorities and ophthalmology societies in many countries around the time of the WHO declaration of the pandemic. During the ensuing weeks and months, the protocols recommendations are changed based on the local, regional, and national um, and global uh, national decisions. But the emphasis by all was that the normal of January 2020 may not approximate the normal of the near future. I believe our foremost learning is that we are not prepared for, for such a pandemic. Although the world has dealing with communicable diseases since ages, 
it looks like the intergovernmental or international organizations has not a structured plan that also takes the globalization into the account. The increased population mobility, international travels, and globalization in trade. All that has amplified the disease transmission. The COVID-19 pandemic brought the, wor uh, the world to a standstill and as I said in the beginning, as we all are expecting, it looks like we will continue dealing with its after effects. It had a devastating effect in all living spaces and especially on clinically vulnerable groups like people with diabetes. IDF European region, as I said in the morning, maybe some of you were not in the uh, morning session. IDF Europe, European region, ran a survey between August and October 2020 during the first wave of COVID uh, pandemic. The survey included the responses of uh, 3,480 people living with diabetes across t 32 countries in Europe. It was about COVID-19, testing and treatment, diabetes management, access to medication supplies, technologies, and care. Respondents were asked to describe their ability to access routine diabetes care, screening for diabetes complications, and non-diabetes related care throughout this course of, of the uh, pandemic. Well, but as I said, during the first wave of the pandemic at that time. I will directly go to the questions that this way or that way uh, deal with the care of the complications. They were, respondents were asked about how they would rate their ability to manage their diabetes. In general, it worsened as would, we would expect and 25% of the respondents reported that they could not manage their diabetes not very effectively or not effectively at all before the COVID period. This rate increased to 39%. As to the barriers to access to care, fear of com contamination was the greatest barrier and travel restrictions were the next common barrier. One of the main issues during the time was limited in-person consultations due to the restrictions and also due to the general um, fear of contamination. About 18% of respondents said that their appointments were cancelled. In about 20% of patients, the appointments were rescheduled. More than 40% of appointments were rescheduled within one month whereas 34% of respondents had to wait for more than two months. Disruptions in access to the multidisciplinary team were quite severe across Europe. For people with diabetes who normally have access to these professionals, more than 50% of respondents found themselves no longer able to access their diabetes nurse. Concerning disruptions to appointments for the screening of diabetes-related complications, more than half of the respondents did not indicate any disruptions. But severe geographical inequalities were not reflected in these responses. Just under one in five respondents reported that their appointments had been rescheduled. As stated in the report, Part of the reason behind the lower levels of reported disruption to screening appointments may be due to the longer time frame between such appointments. This means that over the time period of the survey, fewer appointments related to complications may have been due to take place. The majority of appointments were rescheduled within a three months period. People with diabetic retinopathy were one of the, again, clinically vulnerable groups 
during the period of the pandemic. First of all, these patients may not have any complaints till the late stages of the disease, even when they have the site-threatening disease. And the treatment for the site-threatening disease would be further delayed. Most countries do not have a national screening program in place to be able to do a risk stratification and determine the patients at higher risk for site-threatening disease. Another important issue in eye care is that this pandemic boosted the discussions around telemedicine in general and also use of a, a artificial intelligence technologies in retinopathy screening. These discussions are good on one side, but the enthusiasm to use them in healthcare without overcoming existing challenges may bring along some risks, especially legal and, uh, legal and ethical ones. In the uh, 1990s and 2000s, the introduction of Fundus Camera and further advances in Fundus Digital Imaging paved the way for mass screening programs in diabetic populations. In teleophthalmology, we either use store and forward mode and transmit images to remotely located healthcare professional or human grader for reading or use the real-time mode that involves a live um, telemedical consultation with simultaneous transmissions of the images. Uh, the store and forward mode is more widely used in retinopathy screening. The artificial intelligence may address the workload and some other challenges of the human grader space but has brought along additional problems, mainly, as I uh, 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 repeated in the previous slide, concerning legal and ethical ones. The mobile health, with its set of applications and devices, is again another area in the practice of medicine and healthcare. Smartphones or other devices are used to capture the images. I want to bring this publication uh, to your attention because it pointed out um, to more or less the most important points in developing any screening program. First of all, such a program cannot be run al uh, with al uh, without allocated funding. Next stage is the availability of assessment and treatment facilities. This is very important as a screening program without a treatment facilities would not serve to a change uh, in real life. Reaching out to the cohort of people with diabetes uh, is another issue. Information to the patients and tr um, I mean, it, it should be forwarded and uh, we should try to maximize the uptake. Next step is the establishment of the IT infrastructure and then choosing the camera. In line with the consensus statement of the British Diabetic Association in mid-1990s, the method should have a minimum sensitivity of 80% and a minimum specificity of 95% for referable retinopathy. And the workforce should be hired and trained the quality assurance of the program is essential in order to achieve the highest possible standards and also to minimize the risks. Again, COVID-19 period has shown us again that we are far behind of having such screening programs or better uh, such structured strict screening programs. Artificial intelligence technology using deep learning systems is one of the most promising areas for AI application in ophthalmology, particularly in diabetic retinopathy screening. The first national screening program to use an automated retinal image analysis system um, as a level one grader was in the Scottish screening program back in 2011. The uh, recent, but recently, the UK National Screening Committee 
reviewed a major program modification, the implementation of automated retinal image analysis system in the screening program in all UK nations. But they concluded that further evidence is needed on the accuracy, clinical utility, and cost-effectiveness of automated retinal image analysis system. They also made an emphasis on social and ethical aspects of AI implementation, to which I will come back in the next slides. I would prioritize two things as the advantage of the AI-based programs. One is reducing the healthcare uh, inefficiencies. The other thing is the images are read and the results can be given within seconds to minutes, contrary to remote reading by experts, where it can take several days. And then, when established, artificial intelligence-based systems may be helpful in reducing the cost of the screening. On the other side, there are many challenges in its implementation. Some of them relate to general to AI-based systems and some others specific to the retinopathy screening. The cost of the system, establishment of the system is high. In low resource settings, it may not be easy. This includes the equipment, maintenance, trained staff to operate the equipment, and secretarial staff, among others. Human graders are still needed for low-quality images. The sensitivity and specificity of the systems need to be assessed according to the different outcomes, like diabetic retinopathy present or absent, or diabetic retinopathy absent or referable retinopathy or sight-threatening uh, disease. Legal and ethical aspects are among the leading concerns about the AI-based systems. Liability is currently a huge question mark. In case of a misdiagnosis or malpractice, uh, the question may arise around the legal approach to claims, whether it is a negligence or product liability. The privacy and dignity of the patients must be carefully considered when designing services. The devices can be hacked, personal information on them can be collected. Responsibility for tech companies that create these products should be heightened, but who is responsible for this currently? Nobody knows. At the end, um, strategies for local, national screening programs and their implementation is needed, whether there is a pandemic like this or not, actually. At the end, the artificial intelligence already pervades many parts of our daily life, even now. But the laws and regulations should catch up with the enthusiasm around the advantages of these advancements in the technologies. Thank you.